<laughs> All right, so welcome. Thank you. So um, what started this is we were invited to go to Seattle to the Resuscitation Academy. And what we found out was that we're doing a lot of great things. What I found out, it's probably my fault, was that we're not involving dispatch enough. Uh, we all know the great things that dispatch does. We're just, on our side, I think we probably need to get them involved more with our QA process, more with um, just just the uh, teamwork that we already have. I think the important part is that you're really responsible for our patients for the first eight to 10 minutes, okay? And when I show you some of the slope of death curves from CPR, if we don't get some hands on the chest to shock in place in the first 10 minutes, um, we're not gonna have a very good shot, okay? And I think the thing that really impressed me in Seattle is that they do everything CPR based with basically 14 paramedics per shift, right? They have seven medic units, double medic, everyone else is EMT, okay? They have two Lucases in the entire department, which they rarely use, okay? I think the Lucas is great, but I think that their hands-on compressions and getting on the chest quickly is great. Their dispatch um, really has improved to get on the chest very quickly, and I'll show you some of the data. Um, I think the, also the impressive part is they're really involving their police department, especially in King County. They have over 450 sheriff's deputies with AEDs in their cars now. And they deploy shops twice a week with their PD. Okay? They also use pulse pointing, which you know, some of our cities have. They've actually taken pulse point to the next level, where pulse point for most of us is we're going to a commercial address with pulse point. Okay? They've actually included all first responders, nurses, and physicians. And they've actually had grants where they put AEDs in those first responders that live in town, and they will allow them to be on pulse point to go into a residence. And they've had zero poor outcomes. They will send a survey to the person that had the first responder go to their home, and it's been nothing but great. And they're just getting more people on the chest and more shocks delivered quickly. Okay? Um, so just raise your hand, stop me anytime if you have questions, and then uh, we can chat about some stuff in the end. <laughs> so basically, Seattle's story is they're kind of the gold standard of CPR, all right? So they kind of started the rock study back in the day, which we were part of here, right? We did a lot of the rock stuff six, seven years ago where we decided to stay in scene for 10 minutes. We decided to wait for a definitive airway for six minutes, and we tracked that, all right? And so when we went to this conference, there's people from Taiwan, Amsterdam, um, Columbus Fire, Madison Fire, um, really throughout the nation and throughout the world. And what we learned was that there's so many hurdles that we've jumped six, seven years ago, right? Um, remember the first time that we told the crew to stay on scene for 10 minutes, right? What did all of us learn back in the day? Get going, diesel saves lives, don't wait, right? So back in the day, what did we do? The first few minutes, we're trying to get an IV. Well, IOs helped that out, right? Then we're trying to get a tube. When, when, was, our, when was our quality compressions? Minute 10? Every minute that goes by without quality compressions is a 10% decrease in survivability. Okay? So if we do nothing for 10 minutes, we're dead pretty much. Okay? So we focused on that. We got crews to stay on scene. And then everyone said, wow, this is great. Let's stay on scene for 15 minutes. Then maybe let's do termination of efforts in the field and not go code through the hospital with a corpse. So there's a lot of hurdles that we have already jumped across. There's a lot of hurdles that I can tell you that multiple agencies in the U.S. and throughout the world have not jumped across. We sat through hour and a half, two-hour lectures on how will we convince our staff to stay on scene for 10 minutes. We're done with that. How will we convince them to put a metronome on and do 100 to 120 compressions a minute and stay in the chest for 90% of the time? We're already doing that. And I think all of us have witnessed the amount of saves that we've had compared to, I know back when I used to do this, okay? I mean, I think back when I was a medic, I probably had one save in my entire career. We've had agencies where they have two or three saves to shift, all right? It's a huge paradigm shift, it's a different focus, and it's up to us to preach that to everyone, including dispatch. So where are we now, that's where we are now, and where can we go? So I would say across the board, our agencies and our dispatch are pretty top notch at what we're doing. There's a few little items that really don't cost a whole lot of money. All right, we're not asking everyone to buy more Lucas's, we're not asking anyone to buy any crazy amounts of, of software and such. There's just little tweaks that we can do that can change our survivability by 20, 
So if you look at 100 people, that's 20 to 30 more people walking out of the hospital every year. That's big, especially with your family member, okay? So where can we go? We'll talk about that today, and then adding dispatch to our team. So this is a system, okay? If you look at EMS, we're really this purple early ACLS, right? Early defibrillation. But we gotta get early access to the patient. We have to get 911 going. We have to get our trucks rolling. There's lots of pieces prior to us even getting there that are really responsible for a lot of these patients surviving. And then obviously where the hospital comes at the end, okay? Seattle does not transport a single patient unless they have a pulse or persistent VF, okay? They don't transport. So next year, obviously we're already doing a lot of termination of effort, but we're gonna get even more aggressive, okay? Their kids, they also don't transport unless they have a pulse, all right? Which I think is pretty aggressive, but I'm just letting you know what they're doing, okay? So when they get there, they send what's called an A car, basically a van shaped, van front ambulance with a box, all right? They said an A car and two engines. Then the medic team shows up in about six minutes. Everything initially is done with AED and manual compressions, okay? They had a crew come in off the street, they had a Laredal mannequin that showed compression depth, showed their time on the chest, showed their bagging rate, showed their tunnel bottom, the whole deal. They hit 98% accuracy, and the medics didn't get there until six minutes. Okay, so we can do all this stuff. Their biggest delay is not moving the patient during the AED analyze phase. Which when our medics are there, we can get a quicker look at the monitor, see the shock or not, and get a shot quicker in my opinion in less time off the chest. Okay, so that's really their biggest delay. Um, they, they are still intubating their patients at six minutes. They're still ventilating all their patients. They're not doing any passive oxygenation. Their belief is by minute six, CO2 is rising, pH is decreasing, and they're becoming hypoxic, and they're having a harder time getting people out, so they're definitely bagging. They're doing exactly the same thing we're doing. They're doing eye gel or mask. They're bagging their patients when, the, when they get there. Not prior arrival, we all wanna push hands on for our guys prior arrival, right? Bystanders, hands on, PD, hands on. But when our guys get there, that's what they're pushing. Same thing that we're doing, okay? Um, so you've got the patient, you have the event, you have the system. We can't control the patient, we can't control the event that they're at, but we can't control the system, okay? So here's patient factors, right? We got smokers, obesity, can't control that. We've also got age, the impact is pretty great. Obviously if somebody that's 35, 40, you have a better chance of getting the back versus 75 or 80, but we can't control who lives in our communities necessarily, okay? Comorbidities, so diabetes, high blood pressure, renal failure, those patients have more of a chance of death, okay? We also have nothing to do with that, okay? So, what's the difference here? You're at your home by yourself, you're probably gonna be assistantly by the time we get there, okay? You're at a quad at a university, or you're out front of admin, or you're you know, someplace in South Lake Town Center, you're gonna have what? Somebody noticing you quickly, getting 911 going, hopefully an AED is gonna be there, and hopefully out of a thousand people there, someone's gonna know CPR enough to get on your chest, okay? So rapid discovery is huge. Location, we got a mall versus your home. Difference, right? What else? Nursing homes. What happens in nursing homes? We just checked on them 10 minutes ago. Probably not true. Okay? So nursing homes will kind of decrease your chance of ROS, decrease your chance of survivability in your town because there's no, it's not a rapid discovery. All right? Initial rhythm, better chance with VF versus A system. All right? So bystander CPR. Big time impact, all right? And that's what it's its up to. Number one, getting telephone CPR going as quick as possible, and I'll show you the time that we should be shooting for. Also for our admin and chiefs and everyone else here, getting people trained, getting CPR programs, getting AD programs. And we're gonna start tracking that on our monthly data, how many people are getting bystander CPR and ADs post prior arrival, all right? That's a huge piece. So time to CPR, less than four minutes, all right? More than four minutes, survivability drops drastically, okay? So here's patient survival by time to CPR. You can see around four to five minute mark, drops off significantly. So here's your time on the bottom and your percent survivability. So quick recognition it's a CPR, hands on the chest by someone, all right? It's not gonna be us. We're still gonna be probably in bed or turning out or getting calling, all right? Time to fibrillation, less than eight minutes. 
you notice all this is before EMS gets there. Okay, so this is, these are these are pieces that's really up to our dispatch to get going. So if there's an AED available, you just shock going less than eight minutes. If you wait more than eight minutes, nine minutes, it starts to trend off. Okay. So these are all different pieces of this puzzle. The registry, I've already got calls into GTAC. We're trying to handle this on a rack level. Basically, the registry is called a CARES registry. It's throughout the entire country. Okay. We input our data, the hospitals input their data, lo and behold, we can figure out who survives. All right? This program costs $15,000 a year that everyone in the state of Texas can play. Okay? If you live in the state of Rhode Island, it's also $15,000 a year. Don't you think that Texas would get it? Every agency would probably have to spend about $40 a year to be on CARES. All right? It's a full-time employee as well. The hospital has to input. But right now, our biggest challenge is did that patient survive, right? And if you're like Carrollton that goes to how many different hospitals, you have to have liaisons giving you input from all those hospitals. If you're a city that mostly goes to one hospital, it's a little easier, but at the end of the day, we just basically put a survey monkey in here where when you actually have a CPR, you will then contact your, your hospital rep, and if that patient survived one out of the hospital, throw that in the survey monkey and we'll put that in the monthly data. And unfortunately, we're leaving that up to EMS chiefs, FTOs, whoever at the agency is taking care of them. Okay, we don't have a great registry system. So low price, high impact. <coughs> Telephone CPR is obviously low price. The biggest thing we have to do is what? Teach and reteach. Teach and reteach. Okay? Very high impact. High performance CPR. We're already doing that. We're probably 95% on high performance CPR. But getting the people at the house to do high performance CPR, right? Man, don't get off the chest. Stay on the chest, right? Sing the song. Try to get 100. You guys can kind of hear in the background. Maybe put a metronome while you're taking the call. Rapid dispatch is really important. Every minute we waste on that front end, this is less time for us to get there and work, okay? Remember, that first 10 minutes is most important. So measuring resuscitation, that's what we're trying to get everyone now to be on board with uh, code stat, and we're trying to make that affordable for everybody so that every single CPR we have we can go back and say, hey, Gary, you guys did a great job that last call, right? Your time on the chest was 90%. Your, your compression rate was 110 the whole time. Your bagging rate was, you know, six to eight a minute. It was a great job. Because CPR may feel great or may feel horrible when you're done. At the end, how are we going to measure how are we going to improve unless we see our data, okay? So that's a very inexpensive thing as well. AD, first response, all that stuff, that's expensive. ADs are costly. Training the public is costly. Okay? Smart technologies like Pulsera, it's expensive. How much of an impact does it have? It still does have an impact, but it's expensive. Um, mandatory CPR AD training. So shouldn't every city person who works for a city be trained in CPR and AD? Right? What if the water guys are out or the parks and rec guys are out and someone goes down? You're just broadening the amount of people that can do CPR. Right? So City of Seattle, every person that works for the City of Seattle in King County, CPR AD trained. So their outreach is great, okay? Accountability, that's up to us. Our culture's up to us as well. So here's disparity. This is what the CARES network will get you. This is that the thing we were talking about that costs the entire state of Texas 15,000 a year. Really, across 125 agencies in 2017, the variance is 6.3% to 81% as far as getting bystander CPR prior to EMS arrival. Six to 80%. Okay, so what does that depend on? How great are we at teaching CPR to our citizens, right? How great are we at getting our city employees PD? And also, how great are we at actually getting ADs out there, which I think would probably incentivize people to get on the chest and get their AD and get shots going as well, but six to 81%, that's a pretty big disparity across the country, okay? So, telephone CPR, double the rate of CPR delivered prior to arrival. Telephone CPR is huge. Okay? Get people on the chest. So their motto in Seattle is that everyone survives. All right? And what they track is VF. All right? VF is truly a test of your system. Okay? If someone's on a Sisley in Carrollton in a nursing home, is that a great test of our system? Probably not. But we didn't get early recognition. Certainly the patient's been down a while. Right? So if we find somebody in VF that's going to test dispatch, it's going to test our bystander CPR, it's going to test our AD program, it's going to test our response, it's going to test our turnout times, and it's going to test how well we do with our high performance CPR once we get there. 
Their motto is, if you're in VF, 100% of those people should survive. Ain't gonna happen. Here's the deal. Let's make our culture that if they're in VF, we should have 100% of these people, right? Our system should, should focus on that. So they talk about these low-hanging fruits. RD is rapid dispatch. We can do good on that, right? High performance CPR and telephone CPR. Those are low-hanging fruits that a lot of agencies in a lot of cities do not concentrate on. Therefore, their survivals are not, survival rates are not great. Any questions up to here? Everybody's calling. Okay. So how are we doing? So there's this disparity. All rhythms, survivability. So communities with over 100 and rest annually, you get a 3% survivability to 30%, tenfold difference. All right? So if we look at Flower Mound, we look at Fort Worth, we look at Dallas, we look all over, there's a tenfold disparity about how many people survive. That's a crazy amount, right? And then here, VF witness, communities over 20 witness VF arrest, 4 to 62% survivability difference, 15-fold disparity. And remember, we can't pick our patients. We can't pick where they go down. But why is there such a disparity? So slope of death, time to telephone CPR, that's dispatches, right? High-performance CPR, part dispatch, part us. Time to defibrillation, dispatch, and us as well, OK? This whole thing is fascinating. Okay, this, this really changed the way I thought about this. So you have a slope of death. You have minutes on the bottom, survivability on the right. If you do nothing for 10 minutes, 0% survivability. Okay? Whatever we can do in that first 10 minutes to augment that straight line down to death allows that patient to survive longer. Okay? So here's a normal, typical urban response. Shows the rhythm at the bottom. 911, you handle the call, you dispatch, wheels roll. On scene, as you can see, all the way along there is becoming what? More like asystole. What's the chance of getting someone out of asystole? Very low. Okay? So, typical shock, typical urban response, 13 minutes, that patient dies. All right? So, the first 8 to 10 minutes is on who? Dispatch. Pretty important, right? We can do whatever we want, we can be as good as we want at 8 to 9 minutes. Dispatch has gotten home the first, those first few minutes. Okay? So they rate it on, they call them underperformers, 10% survivability, we're just talking about VF here, okay, because that's how we test our system. Average 30% survival, the best practice is 50% survival, okay? So here's the underperformers. 10% survived VF. No high performance CPR by EMS. And trust me, there are a ton of agencies there that are still shocked that we should stay on board and stay on scene for 10 minutes, okay? We're past that. Almost no telephone CPR, very few early AD applications, and no rapid dispatch. All right? 10% of these people make it out, even with VF. So here's the only place in the curve. You get dispatches taking two minutes, turnouts taking a minute, four-minute response times on all of these. Basically, at patient side, you get compressions going, CPR goes, and then bam, defibrillation in 10 minutes, 10% chance. Okay? So the only place that we really augment this curve is kind of we get there and start doing CPR and then shock. Okay? So here's an average performer, 30% survive from VF, high performance CPR, which we do, late telephone CPR, so it takes too long. Remember, we want to get on board within four minutes. Occasional early AED application, no rapid dispatch. And so the only time that we change this is it's taking an extra minute to dispatch from what they recommend, turnouts the same, telephone CPR at four minutes, so kind of right on time, but what they're calling is a little bit late, so we augment the curve there. Still takes us four minutes to get there. We start at, you know, basically getting to the patient's side and high performance CPR here, so our curve augments here as well. The fibrillation here, so basically 30%. All right? Now here's the best practice, here's what Seattle does. So 50% walk out of the hospital from VF, 100% high performance, so dispatch is really pushing this too, right? Get your rate up, come on, to get a metronome going, all right? Let's get to between 100 and 120. Stay in the chest, don't get off the chest until someone relieves you. 75% of the time they're doing telephone CPR. All right, it's not 100%, 75%. AED applied less than six minutes, 5% of the time. That sounds like kind of a crummy number, right? 
and even mm -hmm. less than five five percent of the time, still increasing these people's survival. Look, because well, we don't have ADs everywhere. People don't have it in their houses. We don't have it in every commercial location. We're not in the middle of a you know a sports field, right? So that's still a pretty good goal in rapid dispatch. So if you look at the difference here, our dispatch is happening in one minute. Okay, we're turning out in a minute. Augments occur. Telephone CPR is starting right there as well, in two minutes instead of four minutes. At scene, they're still figuring about a four minute response time. At patient side, high performance CPR is augmenting the curve. Defibrillation happens about a minute earlier. And now instead of 10% walking out, 30%, we have 50% of our VS walking out of the hospital. Okay? So, little pieces there. Okay? So, this is kind of the high performance system. You can look at the top here. Uh, time between 911 call and out of hospital cardiac arrest recognitions less than 60 seconds. Time between 911 delivery telephone CPR is basically less than 120 seconds, two minutes. The minimal acceptable down here is not what we're shooting for. We're shooting for up here. Any questions on that? All right, so this is interesting. So they had a bunch of security officers at a casino. All right. Survivability was 74% when they defibrillated within three minutes of witness collapse. And I would say that's pretty hard to do. So you got guys on you know, little scooter deals, someone goes down, someone calls for them, they get an AED on, they analyze, and shock within three minutes, 74% of those people survive. 50%, come on. The rest? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, all right, so this is interesting too. We can do our initial training today automatically, here's years down here, automatically, bam, we have the K. So all the knowledge, all the hands-on, all the mega code practice, right? All the dispatch practice with our people, we have to get on board and we have to stay on board. So they recommend every three to six months, I'd say every three months. So at the stations, we need to be doing mega codes, get on the chest, get the muscle memory down, right? Dispatch, we gotta practice some calls, we gotta get, get people rolling, right? Uh, this is interesting that there actually was no out of chest CPR until 1960, okay? Prior to that, they only did CPR when they did thoracotomy and opened the chest. So CPR is actually a pretty new topic from about 1960. So we're talking, you know, probably 60 years old, okay? What they realized there is that anyone, anywhere, can now start to resuscitate you, okay? So the arsenal that we have, I would say that all these things up top are not very important. These are the two most. CPR and shock, okay? Obviously, if someone's hyperkalemic, calcium and magnesium are gonna be important, but number one is we gotta get on the chest and we gotta do the shock, all right? And that's why their survivability is so great, even with EMTs. So here is basically time to collapse is on the bottom, and basically percent survivability is on the left. The longer we wait to get the shock, that's how it, uh, it's, a, it's a linear line. If you can give CPR, it kind of helps to augment that curve to help with survivability. All right, I'll show you why here in a minute. So this guy was one of the main guys with Dr. Idris who did the rock, and he happened to be in Seattle. So what's interesting is kind of where a lot of people said we'll go over it. So the red is ATP, so ATP is energy, okay? When the person goes down, you can see the red goes down and down and down and down. As the ATP goes away, this nice rhythm up here, which we can shock out of, very quickly over 10, over what? How many minutes? 30 minutes? Goes to here. And I'd say it's probably even quicker. So the whole idea is if we can get on the chest, we start getting more ATP around, making this ugly rhythm over here back into something like a course VF that our AED or our defibrillator can shock them out. That's why CPR is so important. Okay? So this is a pig model. Basically, this is initial BFib, very coarse. This group here didn't get CPR. This group here got CPR for 30 minutes prior to shock. Zero of 10 got ROS here. Five of 10 got ROS here because this rhythm is a whole lot better to shock out. All right, so even when they're going to find the AD, get on the chest, we want this rhythm to start looking like this. And when we get the AD, we can shock them out of it. Or if you don't have an AD, get on the chest when we get there, hopefully it's gonna look like that or that so we can shock them out of it. 0 of 10 got ROS, 5 of 10. Completely different deal. That's why when we get there, what do we do first? Get on the chest, no matter what, okay? So, compressions, 
And this is up to dispatch as well. So you want to compress, and you want to completely let off the chest. That's hard to teach over the phone, I get it. It's hard to convince people to do this, but man, make sure that you're completely letting off the chest with every compression. Because we're pushing blood out, but the only way for the blood to return is if we let off the chest. All right? So these are the big metrics, 100 to 120. We can accomplish that with a metronome like we used to do. I will tell you that I think probably with the new protocol revisions, we're not going to do Lucas till 10 minutes, all right? Because it's taking too long to get the Lucas on across the board, all right? Um, compression depth, two inches. Compression fraction is greater than 80% of the time on the chest. Uh, Seattle's doing 90% and no leaning. Okay, I've done some mega codes with some agencies recently. There's a ton of leaning. When we lean, we stay on the chest. We don't allow recoil. We don't allow the heart to refill, and therefore it changes the, these patients' chance of survivability. Control breathing as well. Okay, so they had a study of shock trauma where every CPR shock trauma they sent a spy. Right? You know how fast people were breathing, respiratory therapists, for CPR? 70 times a minute. Okay? So it should be breath, 10 compressions. Breath, 10 compressions. All right? And all we want to do is see the chest rise. All right? We don't want to put two hands on the bag. We don't want a ton of tidal volume. And for the dispatchers, really, they're not going to be breathing. They probably just need to be hands on anyway, so it doesn't matter. But for us, we've got to make sure we're not overbagging. So here's how we know that 100 to 120 is the sweet spot. Really, if you come up here and start doing compressions at 140, 150, your survivability is going to drop. If you're over here, 75, 80, it's going to drop. And so you'll see Idris up there. He's the one that did the rock with us. And then this Kadumchek, this Russian guy here, he was at Seattle teaching us this. Okay? So here is our two inch depth. All right? So if you're doing a two inch compression, really it's 1.9 to two inches, is really the sweet spot. If you're down here doing a 1.2 to 1.3 inch compression, your survivability changes by 50%. All right? We're talking about 0.7 of an inch difference. All right? So that's why Lucas is good. However, we can't have a delay in getting it on if the first 10 minutes are our most important time. Okay? Very important with the depth. This shows as we're doing CPR, sicily and diastole is coming up. As soon as we stop, Everything goes back down. Okay, so we're not getting perfusion. And that's just over 30 compressions. Okay, it takes about 30 compressions to go from here to there. So this shows your peri shock pause. So basically, if dispatch is talking to someone about AED and they're analyzing and they're shocking, the most important thing is to do what? Back on the chest. Okay? For us in the field, we really want less than 10 seconds. Seattle's shooting for seven seconds. So you're off the chest, you look at your monitor real quick, shock of or not, get back on the chest. Charge up, off, deliver shock, back on, okay? The post-shock pause is the easiest to do because we've shocked now, the only thing we do is get back on. We don't care what the rhythm is, we get back on. Okay, so for dispatch, once the shock's hit, get back on the chest, two more minutes. We're not analyzing again for another two minutes, okay? So these, these peri-post-shock pauses are interesting. So. Less than 10 seconds off the chest versus greater than 20 seconds off the chest, you've got a survivability change that is fairly significant, about 18% of the shows. Okay? This shows the effects of incomplete chest decompression. So if you're giving a compression and you're letting off fully versus giving a compression and only letting off about 75%, you talk about the heart perfusing and the brain perfusing. This line right here, this, this graph right here, is basically your 100% recoil, you're off the chest, right? Both times. If you're only allowing 75% recoil, this is the change of your coronary perfusion and your cerebral perfusion, 33 and 53%, with only a 25% leaning, okay? So that's important, compress completely off, compress completely off. And then this shows how we're bagging. We're bagging. 12 times a minute versus 30 times a minute, this is the intrathoracic pressure in your chest. We don't want high intrathoracic pressure because the heart cannot refill. So over here, if you're bagging 12 versus bagging 30, here's how your survivability drops. And you can imagine someone bagging 70 in shock trauma. Okay? Their survivability has got to drop about two and a half times that. Okay? So that's why it's really important to make sure that when the EMS gets there and we're bagging, just enough for chest rise, one breath, 10 compressions. All right, so we've got the art of it is 
performance and quality, ongoing QI is very important. That's why COSTAT's important for all of our agencies. That's why ongoing training for, for dispatch is important. Giving them feedback, right? How do we know how we're doing? I mean, a CPR could feel great or it could feel horrible, but how would you know until you actually get the numbers of what percentage of time you're on the chest, right? What was your compression rate? All of that stuff. And it's so simple with a metronome to get your compression rate right. It's so simple to get your depth right and your compression rate, uh, compression rate right once we get a Lucas on, right? But we don't want to pause too long to get the Lucas on. That's the challenge, all right? And then success stories, all right? All of us have them. When we have a success story that involves police or dispatch or our crews, we've got to get it out, right? We've got to have a good feedback loop. Hey, you guys did a great job, and here's our success story, and here's our save, and have them come to the banquets and speak and all that stuff, right? And then we also are going to start tracking our survivability. I mean, how important is a ROSC number? It's okay, right? But if we looked and said, like Grapevine last month had two people walk out of the hospital, that's going to be on our data now, okay? I want to see how many people are surviving per year at all our agencies, because ultimately those are people going home to their family. That's a lot more important than a... 30% ROS, 70% ROS, because now the ROS are bought, right? How many people walked out of the hospital because of all the stuff we're doing, right? And then the science, we know how performance CPR works, it's defined by the science, we know telephone CPR is really important. And then basically, we've, we kind of know this in the fire service is that we've got high frequency events, low risk, right? The stub toe we respond on, the earache we respond on. Down here, we've got the low frequency, the high risk of a bad outcome. Right? And those are the ones we have to train for as well. Those are important. So the big thing on this was, and this dispatch can kind of speak to this at the end, but you had 176 cases, dispatch listened to the calls. About 50% of the time, we kind of recognized it as CPR right away. Okay? 64% of the, of the people calling clearly stated that the patient was breathing. Okay? The other 44% said, Yes, but they're gasping, okay? So 64% of this 44% that said they were gasping, they're actually CPR in progress. That's the challenge. The real challenge for dispatch is, are they breathing? Oh, they're gasping. Well, are they, are they actually purposely breathing or not, right? So I will tell you what Seattle's doing is they're asking, is the patient conscious, yes or no? They get a no. Is the patient breathing, yes or no? They do not ask them to check for a pulse. If they are not conscious and not breathing, they're on the chest, okay? The side effects from doing CPR are pretty low. If it's an opioid overdose, guess what the guy's gonna do? He's gonna wake up, right? If the guy's altered from a UTI, what's he gonna do? Probably gonna wake up, it's a sternal rhythm. We do it to everyone when we walk up there anyway, right? So, are they conscious now, are they breathing now? On the chest. That way CPR is starting a lot quicker, because even us in the field, they have a pulse or not, I don't know, they have a pulse, I see field pulse, I don't know, I can't feel a pulse, right? Even it takes us a while sometimes. It doesn't matter. Get on the chest. Okay? That's what they've changed in Seattle to be on the chest quicker. So American Heart recommends QI of 100% of all EMS confirmed calls for cardiac arrest or dispatch. Okay? QI on every single one. They also recommend three to four hours of initial training for all dispatch, two to three hours of ongoing training annually. And I would probably break that up every three to four months. Okay? Um, there's a telecommunicator CPR program, performance recommendations, they're all at this website, and American Heart has it pretty well outlined. If you guys need these slides, I'll send them to Chief and you can get them to all. So quality telephone CPR, you know, being complete with our instructions, instructing the compression depth, allow recoil, compression rate, continuous compressions. Um, they're also doing audio recording of every one of their CPRs on their modem on their life pack. And that's pretty powerful. As you're hearing the guys reason through what's going on, you can hear the compressions, you can hear them off the chest, on the chest, you can tell when they're intubated, when they're intubated. but they've been doing that for about the last seven years. Pretty powerful. Um, so, we're gonna start getting, oh, this stuff is well. I'm gonna get dispatch involved with our EMS, uh, best EMS QA committee, so we have it about every two to three months. We usually have it at Trophy Club, we go over all of our data, we go over our quality initiatives, um, CQI programs, FTO programs, this Friday, we actually have one at Trophy Club, and we're, we actually have the, uh, uh, the lady from Life Gift come to speak to us about organ donation. Uh, police AED programs, I think if you don't have one, you should talk about one. There's some funding out there to get AEDs for your PD. And not only that, but maybe have some of the fire guys go out and say, maybe make them a little more comfortable, 
Okay, it sounds like not all officers, when they're in the area, are necessarily getting there quickly. Maybe driving around, a little apprehensive about getting on the chest. Get your hands on the chest. Don't worry about breathing for these patients. Just start compressions, get the AED on. Maybe do some mega codes with PD to make them a little more comfortable. But when you think about it, PD is doing what? They're always roaming around. They may get flagged down from the CPR, right? Middle of the night at three in the morning, they're riding around. So um, I think that's a worthwhile program. Pulse point ideas, obviously Chief Irving have got it here, but taking it even beyond going to a commercial building, right? So if Tyson lives in town and we could fund him with an AED through some grants, and he could put himself on pulse point. What if he's driving around heading to Lowe's and CPR here, right? Walk in the patient's house and come. Just extra ways of getting pulse point to work better for us, more outreach for CPR. Uh, citizen CPR programs, I think we're all working on that. City employee CPR programs. Also, they talk about separate tones for CPR. So all their PD, so in King County, they had 450 officers over four years that were given AEDs in their cars, okay? They deploy an AD twice a week in King County from a police car. That's pretty impressive. Okay? There was one guy that held out, said, I'm absolutely not doing this program, I'm not doing CPR, blah, blah, blah. His buddy was on a felony stop with his partner. He went into cardiac arrest, but he pulled the AD out of the car, shocked him, got him back. And so Monday morning, the naysayer went and said, I'll take an AD. Okay? So these programs work. They have a tone that goes out on their police channel. If there's a CPR in progress, the fire's going to. Everybody, everybody here, you're close, they're gone, okay? There's also separate tones for the fire department. So, just like Shropshire fire tones in a lot of our towns, there's a CPR tone. And I can tell you, just like I see you guys run out for Shropshire fire, you're probably gonna run out a little quicker if it's a CPR tone, all right? Probably gonna help our turnout times a little bit. Um, so I just wanted to dispatch to see, most of us are seeing it, but we've decided for all of our agencies, and this is last year, we've had a few more added. This is our CPR data. All right, every agency is unblinded, and we've decided to do that across the board. So uh, we track, now we've added bystander CPR prior arrival, we've added AD prior arrival, and we've added survivors. So survivors is up to your EMS chief to get with us with their data. This is just a piece of it. We have 35 points that we're following. This is just cardiac arrest information, okay? So we're tracking on our side, the cool part is that every agency wanted to be unblinded, they want to be compared every month, and they want to get better together. And I think that's that's pretty great. Okay? Um, this is some data that was sent over from some of your dispatch agencies, and I actually thought it was pretty good. I believe this is McKinney's, and I believe this is just the last 10 CPR calls they had, but the call received to call routed was pretty quick. It's like pretty much within a minute for most of these. Sometimes two minutes, so maybe a little bit improvement there. Um, but I think if you track this, it'll it'll be interesting for you guys. I think this is Collieville's time, so call the dispatch. It's like almost every time is within a minute. Some that one was like 18, 19 seconds. Call time in routes of turnout times, it's like a minute to two minutes. And then call time to bystander CPR. This is about two and a half minutes, which is good. Uh, PD was actually there on these two. I believe one or two of these made it, right? So shows the importance of that. The rest of these did not have any CPR prior arrival, so obviously we can hopefully improve on that. And then call time to AD placement, it says none. And then response time is four minutes, five minutes, so pretty much within the standard that we saw in the previous, uh, previous graphs. And then this is, I think, great bonds. So I think this is pretty important. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six patients at Ross in the field, CPR and ED, so crash, I guess we killed them, crash. And then this patient, uh, that was an interesting case, that patient was hypothermic. Um, and then they field turn one, so let's crash for that one. No, I didn't. Um, there must, must have been in a facility, facility um, because that's, that's what they notated in the notes, is like CPR by the crash part. Yeah, so I mean, I think these are all pretty good too. You got AD here and AD there, so two ADs. Any questions? <coughs>